pleasure to be with you. Um, I've been in this game rather a long time. I gave my first talk on climate change in the mid 1980s. I've been talking about it ever since and, uh, and it has become ever more relevant. So my job is to tell you about the sort of uh, what the problem is and try and paint the large scale mix picture and then Liz is going to come in more with a local UK picture of what, what it might mean. So I thought I'd start off with well what is this greenhouse effect? What, what's it all about? And the greenhouse effect is, is if our planet was just sitting there in space being heated by the sun and we didn't have an atmosphere it would all be frozen. So the greenhouse effect is actually a very good thing because it explains why we're here. It warms our planet. Now what happens is we have an atmosphere and there's gases in that atmosphere that allow the sun's radiation, the, the heat from the sun to come in. But then the earth warms up and these gases stop that heat escaping directly. And so in doing so, they warm the planet. So they're a really good thing, but they're having greenhouse gases and this greenhouse effect. But actually, like a lot of things, too much of a good thing can, can be uh, not so good. So. Um, the main gas we, we talk about is carbon dioxide. And the reason we talk about that is, is it actually is a very important greenhouse gas and it's going up. So it was first measured in 1957 um, and it's been measured ever since that was that 64 years or something. And in that 64 years, the amount in the atmosphere has gone up by about a third. And that is a large change if you compare that. It's, it's actually now larger than it's been for the last three million years. So, um, and we know since the Industrial Revolution, it's actually gone up by a half. So we've got a lot of extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And inevitably, because what we know about greenhouse gases, then that's going to warm the, um, warm the climate. So, um, just a little few more facts about carbon dioxide. If we put some in the atmosphere, suppose we, we drive down the road and we put sort of um, a certain, uh, well, if, suppose we have 100 tonnes and we put it in the atmosphere now, and we come back in a thousand years, if you think you can come back in a thousand years, you'll find that there's still more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, about 15 to 40 tonnes. So almost half would still be there in a thousand years. So this is, once you added carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it stays there a long time. Now we know this rise in carbon dioxide is due to us. We know that in all sorts of different ways. So it's absolutely certain that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone up and it's due to us. And what we add is going to stay there a very long time. So that means we've warmed the climate system already. And we're going to keep on warming it as long as we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So the only way to stop that warming is to stop adding this greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. It's carbon dioxide and some others, but we won't go into that. So this is, this is the, the problem we have. Well, okay, that's all right. So that's all about greenhouse gases. And it's been known since the 19th century, this, in fact, the, this, the effect of greenhouse gases. So it's not new. The new thing is actually how the gases have gone up and also how the climate's been changing. So has it actually been warming? Well, yes, it has. I don't know whether it's going to show you. I said I wouldn't have any slides, but I can show you one thing which I can't see now because I think it's in the way here. But on the right hand side is what the temperatures were like in 1850. And the blue color means they were cold. And then you can see 2020 is on the left. Uh, on your right hand side, I'm getting confused here, and 2020 is over here, and the red colours mean it's got a lot warmer. So it's got a lot warmer, and we know it's got, it's, the temperature of the earth has gone up by about a one and a quarter degrees in that period, and most of the increase, as you've seen there, is actually in the last 50 years or so. So the earth has got warmer. It isn't just it's got warmer, there's other things that go with that. So uh, what are the things? Well, so sea level rises. So why does sea level rise? Well, the, um, the ocean warms and it, water doesn't expand much when it freezes, or when, it, when you heat it up, but it does expand a little. And that's the main input to the rise in the ocean, the sea level rise. But it's also the melting of ice on the land and more importantly now at the two poles. Greenland, the ice sheet is melting 
and also the Antarctic ice sheet is now contributing to sea level rise. We know that's the case. So there's no uncertainty about all this, it's there. But we see some other things too. Um, you've probably seen pictures of the Arctic um, ice, the, the sea ice in the Arctic and how it's been decreasing. And that's been a big effect. Um, one other thing I'll tell you about, well, perhaps two others, a warmer atmosphere can hold more water. Um, if you put your washing out on a sunny day in the summer, then it dries quickly. In the winter, when it's colder, it, it doesn't dry as quickly. And it's a very large effect. If the atmosphere is six degrees warmer, it can hold half as much water again, 50% more water. So it means if, if we get a climate that warms by five degrees or six degrees, then the same rainstorm would be 50% stronger. The rainfall we get out of it would be 50% stronger. So it's a very large effect. And what we're seeing all around is actually the extreme rainfalls are increasing. And we've seen it in the UK many times, and I, I'm sure Liz might talk about it, so I won't say too much, but um, many of us have been through flooded situations in recent times. One other thing I'll mention too, tropical cyclones. Tropical cyclones get their energy out of the top, the warm ocean where it's very warm. That's where the energy comes from. So as you warm up the ocean, then they can get stronger. And indeed, we've been seeing record tropical cyclones around in many times in recent years. So these things are happening. So what about the future? Well, the future depends on what we do. And if we don't do much, then the temperature all the models tell us, and these are models not based on a bit of seaweed or whatever, they're actually based on Newton's laws of motion and things like that, and they're developed from weather forecast models in the, originally. And there's a range of things come out of them, but essentially if we don't stop what we're doing, we just continue adding greenhouse gases like, like there's, there's nothing to worry about, then the temperature will rise probably something like four degrees by the end of the end of this century. That's the global temperature rise, something like four degrees. And almost ever, everywhere the temperature would rise. Over the ocean, it warms less because of this, the ocean takes a lot of heat to warm it up. But over the land, it would rise by more than four degrees. And so five degrees in the tropics. You imagine adding five degrees to the temperatures in Bangladesh, say, or wherever. Um, you know, life becomes really very difficult to live. And it's not just that. If we actually then look at our latitudes, then we're talking about in the winter time in the northern Eurasia, say, then something like a 10 degrees temperature rise in the winter. And you can imagine what would happen to the permafrost in that situation. I mean, it just wouldn't be perma or frost anymore. And um, we're also looking at an unequal temperature rise. So it's different in different places. Now, weather depends on the temperature contrasts. And if those change, then our weather will change. So it's not just we gradually warm like this and it's all just simple like that. The weather changes. The extremes of heat temperature become really much more extreme. And the rainfall changes as well. You know, so where it's wet in the tropics, we expect to get even wetter. And where it's dry, we expect to get even drier. And places like the Mediterranean become really quite borderline in terms of the crops that can be grown there. Australia, um, South Africa, many places become really quite marginal in terms of um, the moisture available for agriculture. So those changes, and then how, um, sea level rise, I've already mentioned sea level rise. Well, the sort of middle of the road thing for the end of the century, if we don't do much, is maybe somewhere close to a meter. Um, and that could be, there's unexpected things that could happen as well. Um, unexpected, but actually physically, we could expect that they might happen. So the Greek, the Antarctic ice sheet, for instance, is really a bit of a concern, um, but it could add more to that one meter. It could be up to two meters. And in fact, the next um, Thames barrier, there, the plans there are to be able to cope with a two meter sea level rise by the, by the end of the century. The, the middle of the road thing might be a meter, but it could be up to two meters. So, Brian, 
I hope you don't mind if I interrupt just to say it's about halfway through the, the slot for yourself. Okay. Well, I was coming to that. I wanted to, um, Liz said I could take slightly more than half and thank you, Liz. So I mean, I wanted to paint that picture. This is one that is a, a picture of a world that's very difficult to cope with. And um, the BMA was said the climate crisis is a health crisis. So what can we do about it? We've got to adapt. So whatever we do, we've got to adapt to these changes. And we've also got to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And I've, what I've told you about carbon dioxide, we've got to reduce them to zero because that's the only way the, the climate will stop changing. Now that's what the international agreements, you've probably heard about Paris, which said, hey, we've got to stop this, the Paris agreement. We've got to limit it below two degrees in which we, we may be able to adapt mostly to what goes on. And the only way to do that is to actually stop these greenhouse gases increasing. And there's became the thing of net zero greenhouse gases by 2050. Now the UK has its um, Climate Change Act, which came in in 2008, and there's targets in terms of adapting to climate change in that, and also reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And in 2019, the target was changed to zero greenhouse gases, net zero by 2050, by the middle of this century. So that's what we're faced with, um, that we have to do that. And are we doing it well? Then to a certain extent we are, we're going quite well, but we're, we're always telling the government you're not doing quite enough to actually meet the targets that we have, both in adapting and in going to this net zero. So we need to do more. Now the UK is going to be an important player here because we have the next meeting, the really important one after Paris, when all the targets are reviewed and what the countries of the world are going to do. And that's going to happen in Glasgow later this year. And that's going to be the big time at which the countries of the world who volunteered what they will do. And that's not enough. It would probably, if they did it, it might keep the temperature rise to three, three and a half perhaps. And we need to get it down to two. So all the countries of the world are going to actually meet together and try and keep that temperature rise make enough pledges to keep the temperature rise below two. And we can be hopeful about that because the US are now back involved. China is actually putting its targets there and liable to increase them. India is getting increasingly involved. It's going to be an important time. I mean, it, we can do it. There's no doubt the technologies are there. We can do it now. The question is, do we have the political will to do it? And we certainly need to do it. And now I'll hand over to Liz to give a more local picture. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And um, Liz, just before we start, um, Brian, you use the term net zero and it's a term that we hear a lot. Can you just give us a really clear explanation of what net zero means? Okay. In terms of the atmosphere, the atmosphere has got to see no more CO2 coming into it, no more carbon dioxide. Now, it could be that, um, and the other greenhouse gases, now it could be that we can, some of the places will be very difficult to stop a little bit going into the atmosphere. And then we have to do other things to try and take that CO2 out, the equivalent amount. So if we're adding some, we have to subtract some as well. And that's the net zero. And we can subtract some by what we do in how agriculture and in, in more trees, and even actually maybe techniques of taking technologies to take a little carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So if we have a little plus, we've got to have a little minus as well. So the net effect is zero. And that's what net zero means. I'm a lecturer in hydrology at Newcastle University. Um, and my research is all about how climate change is impacting floods and droughts in the UK. Um, so this is what I'm here to talk about the, this morning, which is the, the effects of climate change on the UK. And I'm going to talk about four main things. So the first thing uh, is the risks that are facing the UK specifically. Um, then the second thing is what changes have we already seen here? Uh, the third is what changes are projected to happen. And the fourth is what's going to happen in the Tyne region specifically, as this is a Tyne assembly. Okay, so number one, what are our biggest risks? So every five years, 
the government um, creates a something called the climate change risk assessment. So the last one was done in 2017 and the next one's going to be in 2022. Um, and this looks at everything, all of the challenges facing us uh, because of climate change and then ranks them and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, basically uh, tells us what we should be most concerned about. So the, the top three things that are our biggest risks in the UK are flooding, uh, heat waves and drought. So um, flooding is number one because basically we already can't really deal with the amount of flooding that we have. We still get millions of pounds worth of damage um, from flooding every year. It causes a lot of uh, disruption and losses to the economy because people can't get places and uh, businesses are closed down for a while. Um, it causes a lot of trauma. If you've ever been flooded, you know that it's a horrific event. You can be displaced from your house by up to a year. Um, so this is a, a really big concern for us under climate change. Um, there are also lots of different mechanisms for getting flooded so it's not just from rivers and um, obviously when uh, we get a lot of water uh, the banks of a river can overtop and so this is called um, river flooding or sometimes fluvial flooding is kind of the fancy name for it and um, but we can also get flooded by surface water so this is where um, you get really heavy rainfall onto ground that water can't sink into so uh, basically concrete um, if we get lots of heavy rain in our cities and um, we get flooding because the water can't drain away fast enough. And then there are other types of flooding, so um, coastal flooding. So because sea level is rising, it's going to mean that our coastal defences might get overtopped more frequently. And then a kind of a lesser known one is groundwater flooding, where the ground becomes really saturated and water seeps up from underneath instead. Um, so our number one risk is flooding. Number two is heat waves. So heat waves are actually our biggest killer from climate change. Um, we don't actually see that many people die from flooding in the UK, so we're quite lucky in that way. Um, and heat waves are the one that really kill people. So there are about 2,000 heat related deaths every year. Um, and a bit like COVID, it's the most vulnerable people who are at risk of uh, heat related um, deaths. So it's old people and ill people, very young children. Um, so it's probably why <laughs> you don't hear about it so much, because it's these vulnerable people in our society who are at risk. Um, and the third one is drought. So drought's the one that I'm the most worried by. Um, I think it's number three because um, with flooding and heat waves, we already experience them and already probably don't do enough to um, sort them out. Uh, whereas with drought, we kind of fend it off every year. So the water companies um, do a, a good job of uh, keeping us <laughs> from dipping into uh, really severe drought conditions and not having any drinking water. Um, but in the future, we're going to see a lot more um, evaporation from these higher temperatures. Um, and so our water supply is going to be um, a lot more at risk. It's all pretty bad, but um, it's fairly small fry compared to the other things that are going on around the world. So um, thousands of people die from flooding um, in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, and there's hurricanes and monsoons and lots of kind of really bad stuff happening around the world. Um, but we do have our own problems to deal with. Um, so point two, what have we actually seen? So this is not using any um, models or anything like that. It's what have we observed in the records um, that we have. So we've been talking about cl uh, climate change for 50 years now. I think the first models were kind of in the 70s. And um, so we have been um, making sure that we're looking out to, to see if we can see any changes in our observations. Um, and in the UK, we've seen that average temperatures have risen by around one degree over the last century. Um, and like Brian showed you on his graph, um, uh, ten, uh, nine of the 10 warmest years have occurred since 2002. So we've got all the high temperatures are, are definitely more recent, which is in line with our projections. Um, this is actually greater in cities um, that feel something called the urban heat island effect. And this basically means that because we've got big concreted areas, they absorb the heat and kind of create this little bubble of higher temperatures around the cities as well. 
Um, we've seen extreme rainfall increase and um, consistent with what Brian was saying. So the, the theory is that um, with every one degree warming, you can hold 7% more water in the atmosphere. And we see that our um, extreme rainfall events have increased at that rate. Um, and we've also seen sea level rise um, around three millimeters a year. Um, and so that's kind of 16 centimeters in total since the start of the 20th century um, when corrected for land movement. So fun fact, <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite facts, mm -hmm. is that um, if this is Scotland and this is um, kind of the south of the UK, um, back in the last ice age, Scotland was covered in lots of ice. Um, and as that melted, it, the ice kind of weighed Scotland down and pushed the ground down. And as that uh, ice melted, um, Scotland is slowly springing back up. And so the UK is actually kind of tilting. So in the south of the UK, um, not only is sea level rising, but the land is also sinking very slowly. So it sees an even exaggerated sea level rise. So if you ever hear uh, about sea levels being corrected, um, that's why the land is actually moving too. What do models tell us? Well, for the UK, it's um, summers. So um, this doesn't mean that we're not going to see any snow in the future. Um, it we there's there's a big difference between climate and weather. So weather is what we experience every day and we know that it can be really variable. So in the past few weeks, we've seen loads of snow and then yesterday it's been like a glorious sunny, super warm day. So um, the, our weather is really naturally variable um, and climate is the average of all of that. So we're gonna see generally um, uh, milder, wetter winters and generally hotter, drier summers. But even though the summers are going to be drier, there's probably going to be a lot more thunderstorms uh, increasing this really extreme rainfall as well. Um, so this obviously means that the number of heat related deaths is going to um, uh, increase a lot as well because it's going to be a lot hotter and we're going to have a lot more uh, flooding. So a lot more frequent flooding. Um, so number four then is what about the Tyne in particular? So um, I think of all the places you could be in the UK, the kind of Tyne region is probably one of the better ones. Um, so we're still at risk of flooding. The Tyne is a massive river and we've got lots of um, people living along the banks of it. And there are obviously other rivers in the region as well. And um, so floods are definitely a big risk for us. Um, and you can go and have a look. The government has lots of resources um, where you can have a look at flood maps and sign up for flood alerts as well. So um, you can find out more about your local flood risk um, through uh, the government. Um, we're definitely going to be affected by heat waves, not quite as bad as um, uh, London, you know, so obviously Newcastle is much colder than uh, places in the south, but we're still going to be affected by heat waves. And drought, again, is still a big risk, um, but relative to other places, um, so we're quite <laughs> well provided for. So Kilda Water has a lot of water in it for a relatively small um, demand uh, from our city sizes. So unlike kind of Manchester, um, which has um, a huge population uh, uh, fed by uh, reservoirs in the Lake District, um, which are at risk of something called flash drought. So this basically means that if you have several dry months in a row, a lot of the water is going to evaporate from the reservoirs there. Um, whereas in the south of England, they're at risk of their, their water comes from the ground. And so their risk is kind of more on a much longer time scale. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. I know it's all quite doom and gloom, but my job was to present the issues that are facing the UK. Um, but I think the good news is that there's lots of, well, there's not lots of time, but there's still enough time to act. And obviously you're all here um, taking action, which is just amazing to see, like, it's great. Um, and I'm personally very hopeful. I think we have a lot of the solutions to hand. We just need to implement them. It's a lot like COVID where the more we do sooner, and the better it's going to be for us in the long run.